Well, thanks everybody. Uh, and here goes. Uh, so having having done my disclaimer, uh, let's begin. Um, so the presentation is things are looking up in the skies for April. And let me bring up the laser pointer. It's all right, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Just, I may need that later. Yeah, perfect. I'll just move that over here. Okay. Um, the uh, full moon will occur on April 6th. It's rising just after sunset. It's called the pink moon. Um, many First Nation peoples uh, chose names that were appropriate to the season. And this is in uh, homage, if you will, to the um, uh, flowers that bloom. It's the uh, uh, phalanx flower that blooms in April. And so this is named after the flower. Uh, the names were adopted by the Farmer's Almanac, as you probably all know. And uh, they were, again, uh, attributed to native peoples. And uh, there was a woman who did a, a whole book on the origins of um, these names and so forth. Uh, Patricia Haddock, who wrote a book called Mysteries of the Moon. So the phases of the moon for this month, you have uh, the uh, full moon on the 6th and uh, you have the new moon on the 20th and we'll uh, cover that again in the, in the next couple of slides. Uh, on April 11th, Mercury will be its highest altitude and its greatest elongation at about 5 p.m. And of course, now that we're moving into the spring months, it's going to be hard to see till about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And uh, it will be uh, its highest and its highest point um, and a magnitude of about 0, 0.0. So it will be something to see once the sun sets or once you start to get a little bit of afterglow on the on the uh, on Mercury. Uh, the moon reaches uh, culmination at 7.20 p.m. on April 13th. We good? What's that? Oh, you can touch screen. Oh, perfect. It's a touch screen, too. April 13th, the moon and its last quarter reaches its culmination at about 7.20 a.m. And, uh, you know, here you can see that I did a, a slide from uh, a lot of the slides are Stellarium, as you guys all do. So uh, I did them also. Um, on April 16th, the moon and Saturn are in conjunction at about 5.30 a.m. Saturn's at a magnitude of 0 0.8. Oops, sorry, I went too far. At 0 0.8, and it'll meet the 26-day-old moon in uh, the constellation Aquarius. Um, from the south shore, uh, the pair will be visible soon after it rises uh, at uh, uh, 0420 in the morning until just before it sets at 308 p.m. So it will be a little hard to catch, but um, the moon will be at a magnitude of minus 11.0, uh, Saturn at 0.8. And uh, so the two are too widely separated to be in the field of view of a telescope will be visible to the naked eye and to uh, smaller uh, frame cameras um, and uh, binoculars. And the, the opults versus conjunction in common practice, uh, it's a gr grouping of objects. And I'll go into a uh, pulse versus uh, conjunction a little later on. Um, so this will be a conjunction, which is more the correct technical term. And I'll cover why that is in one of the further slides. Okay, we are going to have a fairly good uh, visibility of the M3 globular cluster. 
in Canis Vendices, which will place it uh, on the evening uh, in the coming weeks on April 18th. Um, it will reach its highest point in the sky at around midnight local time and in subsequent evenings, it will culminate four minutes earlier each day. Uh, from the south shore, it's going to be visible all night and will become visible around 8.44 uh, p.m. at about 39 degrees above the eastern horizon. Uh, it will reach its highest point at uh, 12.51 a.m. Um, at about 77 degrees above the southern southern horizon, which will be lost at dawn in the dawn twilight by about five o'clock. Now there will be a um, what they've called a hyper uh, solar eclipse, and I had to do some research to find out what a hyper solar eclipse is. And what it's telling me is a hyper eclipse is an eclipse that is both a full solar eclipse and a partial annular solar eclipse, depending on where you're viewing it from. That's what they're calling a hyper. So it will be visible from Western Australia through Eastern Timor and Eastern Indonesia between 9.36 p.m and 2.59 uh, Eastern Standard Time, even though we're talking about uh, Asia. Uh, from the contiguous United States, you won't be able to see the eclipse. Uh, this is the range, as you can see on the chart, this is the, the pattern of the eclipse. So if you're going to be in uh, Southeast Asia or Australia and part of uh, New Zealand, you'll be able to see it. So the question is, is anybody in the group going to uh, view this eclipse? No, me neither. <laughs> I'm hoping for the next one next year. If anybody wants to drive. Okay. Anybody got a, got a fairly decent sized plane? We could all jump on the plane and go. So what, what's the significance of the blue line? The blue line is my understanding is at the point where it's it's just about maxed out. So yeah, this this portion of the blue line, my understanding is this is just about where it maxes out over the Pacific. Think about uh, the hyper uh, light when the sun is high in the sky, you're four thousand miles closer to the moon than when it, the moon is on the horizon. So that's why the name is a little distant. This is 4,000 miles. There's no okay. So, yeah, so that's why. Um, so, when it, when it, the moon and the sun are blowing in the sky doing the eclipse, the moon is 4,000 miles away. Away. And when it's high in the sky, the sun is supposed to be down. Yeah. So, you're more closer to uh, the center of the, the shadow. Oh, okay. The tower of the yeah. so The moon is a little bit larger, not much, maybe. Maybe a minute on second and something yeah. like that. As I was trying to do my research on this and trying to learn a little bit more about this, you get you get a um, a coronal ring, a really nice coronal ring. I, I understand on a full eclipse. And although I did see the the last one a couple of years ago with uh, you know sun rated glasses, um, but on the um, on the uh, annular eclipse, that uh, coronal ring is a little bit wider. Does that sound right? I think I got that right. Um, it's a little bit smaller and a little bit more compact on the solar eclipse. On the annular, it's a little bit wider and a little bit more dispersed. So thank you, Dave, for verifying that I got that right. So we, we're coming up on the 16th of April to the Lyrids me meteor shower, uh, which will produce a peak rate on the 23rd of about, I think I said about 18, 12 to 18 meteors. So you're going to be looking for 
the uh, radiant point in the constellation Hercules, and uh, and it should radiate from about there. Over this period, there'll be a chance to see Lyrid meteors whenever the shower radiant point is above in Hercules is above the horizon. With the number of visible meteors increasing, the higher the radiant point gets in the sky. And uh, this is a shot that was taken from uh, from uh, inthesky.org, which kind of outlined what the uh, radiant point would look like. Now, um, the moon and Venus will share the same right ascension with the moon passing within 1.18 degrees to the north of Venus. Um, and uh, the moon will be three days old. Um, around the same time, the two objects will also make a close approach, technically called an oppose, which we'll go into a little further afterwards. From the south shore, however, the pair will be visible from soon after it rises at about eight o'clock uh, in the morning until soon after it sets at 11, 12 in the evening. Oh, cool. And also, when they talk about the hourly rate, very often you'll see EHR next to that number. That stands for, it's not here, I don't see it, but it stands for the initial hourly rate. So that assumes that the radiant point is at the zenith point of the sky. Oh, okay. In order to see that amount. In order to see that amount. Thank you. That That's good. I'm learning. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. He does. He does. He knows everything. Okay. So, um, and we covered the moon and Venus. Now, the uh, puppets meteor shower is going to pl take place very close to the horizon in the southwestern sky. And it will be very, very difficult to see. Uh, actually, from what I gathered um, from the, the South Shore, and this is going to be April 15th to the 28th, it's going to be very, very difficult to see. The, um, I did learn that the uh, shower originates from the comet Greg Scalaris. Scalaris. And uh, let's see, I think I had another note on that. Um, yeah, it's it's above the horizon with the number of meters increasing, the higher the radiant point in the sky. And like I said, unfortunately, however, the radiant point of the puppet's shower is only ever above the horizon during the daytime, which means that you really aren't going to be able to see it uh, from uh, Long Island. You might catch it just at dawn, but it'll be difficult. The moon and Mars will share the same right ascension with the moon passing three, uh, three degrees, 13 minutes to the north of Mars. The moon will be six days old. And around the same time, the two objects will also make their close approach, technically and a pulse. Uh, from the south shore, the pair will be visible soon after they rise at about 1014 until just about when they set uh, at 1.24 in the morning. And here you have uh, the moon and Mars. First quarter moon will be on the 24th of April. Uh, on Thursday, as, as seen from our area, uh, the moon surface is 46% and growing larger, seven days young moon is in Leo and will be visible soon after it rises at 11.42 p.m. Uh, until soon after, it's just before it sets at 2.46 a.m. From the south shore, uh, it will be visible again soon after it rises until just about 2.46. Um, at this time, it's in its monthly cycle 
it will appear almost exactly half illuminated. The moon's orbit, uh, or it's interesting. I, I didn't realize this. The moon orbits, you guys all probably know this, orbits um, the Earth, uh, its phase cycle is 29.5 days. And so um, this, is, this is going to be at its um, quarter. Okay, I got to go back one slide. The uh, principal constellations to look for in April are Antella, uh, Chameleon, Crater, Hydra, Leo, Leo Minor, Sextant, uh, Eurasia Major and Eurasia Minor, Leo and Leo Minor, and Orion, all, lake, all located in the uh, Northern Celestial Hemisphere. What's it? Some of these are southern hemisphere. Oh, are they? It's southern? Oh, okay. Then, yeah, when I did the research, I thought I understood that they. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I mis misunderstood the data when I was trying to to uh, do the research on this. So thank you for clarifying that, Dave. Don't worry about it. We all screw up when we're standing in front of it. <laughs> well, it's, it's when you put it together that you know. <laughs> now, we come to asterisms. And Ken and I were talking about this the other day. So what is an asterism? It's a collection of stars we recognize in the sky that is either part of a constellation or part of several constellations, made up of several constellations. One of the asterisms that will be, be visible uh, this month and through May is the spring triangle. It's actually a triangle within a triangle. Uh, the, the primary triangle is uh, Arcturus, Speca, and Regulus. But there's an actually the triangle within the triangle is Arcturus, Speca, and Denobola. Thank you, Denobola, which actually may be easier to see. Uh, when I looked it up on Stellarium, it actually seemed to be easier to see the smaller triangle within the larger one. Um, and uh, that is um, in the southern sky. Uh, and rises with the constellations of Boots, Leo, and Virgo. So here again, Dave, help me out on this one. I pulled what I understood to be uh, some of the primary uh, asterisms for this month and going into next month. And I did a little bit of a description. The fish hook is in Scorpius. The head of the serpent in serpents, the constellation. The teapot is in Sagittarius. I have the teapot over uh, here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the W, of course, is Cassiopeia. Uh, Jacob's coffin. Now, this is interesting. Jacob's coffin is very difficult to spot as an asterism, for what I understand. And I tried to research how the name was arrived at for Jacob's Coffin. And all I could get, and I used uh, this chat for the new AI uh, database program. All it said is it was probably named after a guy by the name of Jacob, who sold, <laughs> that's all I could get. Job. Job. Job's Coffin, by, by a guy by the name of Job, who actually saw a coffin in the sky. So. Uh, really, um, it's a dolphin, yes. Yeah, I had seen that, that it was actually in Delphine. Um, now, uh, some of the other ones, of course, you've got Orion, you've got the belt and the stars in Orion. Uh, one of the other interesting ones that I did a little research on was um, Frederick's Glory, which is here. Now, Frederick's Glory, interestingly enough, is is a pretty much of a defunct, even a defunct asterism. Uh, people aren't really finding it that much. It was named after Frederick the Great, um, ruler of Prussia, 
and it was named by Johann Bode in 1786 in tribute to um, uh, Frederick the Great. Um, and then you have, uh, let me pull this up. Uh, and it's it's in the uh, in the constellation Cepheus, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, and Cygnus. You may be able to spot it with a telescope. The constellation itself is no longer in use. Lorenz, which is over here, I just had it. Oh, yeah, Lorenz uh, are the four stars which form the head of uh, Draco the dragon. Lorenz is a diamond or rhombus shape. The keystone is an asterism formed by the four relatively bright stars in the constellation Hercules, Pi, Eta, Zeta, and uh, Epsilon. Hercules and Orion's belt, of course, we mentioned before. Uh, and of course, the most common is the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, which are actually part of a uh, Eurasia Major and Eurasia Minor, which are the constellations that they fall in. Cassiopeia W? Cass yeah, Cassiopeia W. That, on one thing, you know, they look like a, a W shape. Then, then when it's on the other side of the pole, outside the pole, then it looks like the N shape. Uh, the, the, the N. The yeah. Uh, when it's on the other side. I noticed actually, as I was trying to do the research, how common the the N or W shape in Cassiopeia is is used by a lot of astronomy programs as their symbol or their moniker, and it's it's a very popular one and used uh, as kind of like a, um, a a symbol for the website. Okay, so now, uh, which one's right? I tried to, to understand the difference between a pulse and uh, a conjunction. And of course, a conjunction is when uh, the two objects are either on the same right ascension or the same elliptical longitude, as opposed to an a pulse, which is where the two objects are near one another in the common sky, but not necessarily on the arc or not necessarily um, on, on right, the right ascension. Those would be a pulse and conjunctions would truly be when they are uh, either on the same right ascension or the same elliptical uh, longitude. And finally, um, a little bit of trivia. For the month of April, Eugene Merrill Shoemaker was born on April 28th, as you can see. He was an American geologist and astronomer who discovered Shoemaker Levy 9 with his wife Caroline and David Levy. Uh, the comet crashed into Jupiter, as you all remember, on, in July of 1994. The impact was, visual, was visible and watched on TV around the world. Interestingly enough, Shoemaker also studied cr terrestrial craters, such as the Barringer Meteor Crater in Arizona, along with the Edward Chaos uh, Crater, providing the first conclusive evidence of its original as an original impact crater. He was also the first director of the United States Geological Survey on astrological research. He was killed, interestingly enough, in a car accident while visiting an impact crater in Australia. After his death, some of his ashes were carried to the moon with the Lunar pro uh, Prospect mission. Uh, there's my little bit of trivia. And so there you have it. Any, <laughs> thank you. Any questions that I probably can't answer, but Dave can. <laughs> 